Before we begin with today's scary stories, I just wanted to say thank you to every one of you that has been subscribing to the channel as well as watching the videos. As most of you have probably already noticed, I've really been doing my best to get you all these video uploads and it's great to see the appreciation being shown. By the way, we're very close to 100,000 subscribers. As of the time of recording this video, we're only less than 800 subscribers away. That's where I want to ask all of you a huge favor. Please make sure to share the creepy fox with at least one family member or even a friend and tell them about all the great scary stories content that they can look forward to. Or you can also share the channel on Facebook, Instagram, X, TikTok, wherever. The beauty is that it's free and easy and it doesn't cost you a single dime. So yeah, let's all work together to spread the message of the creepy fox and let's reach that big 100,000 subscribers. Anyway, with that said, let's get started with the scary stories. This was an experience I had alongside my BFF in high school. This was about 2006, maybe 2007, in rural upstate New York. We met in third grade and are still friends to this day. We are both 27 years old now. Now let me give you some background information. My friend, B, and myself became instant friends when we met in third grade and were inseparable. We frequented each other's homes so much that her mom set up her guest room as my room. I had toys, clothing, pictures, I mean everything I needed was there. I was basically family. Pictures of B and I hung on the walls of the home owned by her very proud mother, Shelly. Shelly always wanted two daughters and loved me so much that she considered me her second daughter. Now, on to the meat and potatoes of the story. Again, this incident took place when B and I were sophomores in high school. Her mother was divorced and dated a few different men, meeting some offsites like E. Harmony. She had been speaking to a man for a few weeks, gushing about how manly and charming he was. She was really excited and always showed us their profile before she decided to go on an actual date with one of these men. She always would say, I need my daughter's stamp of approval. One night, she called us to her room and showed us this man that she had been talking all about. His profile was simple, as one would imagine for a middle-aged man in 2007 on eHarmony. The headline read, Looking for a strong mother. I made a joke about this odd placement for caps and just how strange of a way to start out, but he moved forward. It told of his metalwork background, his love of cold steel, and his work in a foundry that kept his icy heart just warm enough. I was honest, and I told her it sounded off, but he was handsome, sporting black, well-groomed hair, a beard, strong jaw, ice blue eyes, and relatively fit body for a 40-something-year-old male. I did distress on the weird vibe, then B joked how Shelly always picked out the anti-social ones, and we laughed knowing this wasn't wrong. Shelly's brought some weird stories home, but what do you expect meeting men online? We told her to go for it, so they planned on dinner. It was a haul for him, about a two-hour drive. He was driving to our location, where they would then take one car into town. B and I helped Shelly pick out her outfit, helped her with her hair and makeup, and then went back upstairs so she could have some time to herself before the long night. We headed upstairs where B and I were painting a wall in her room, just listening to music and cutting up. He just let himself in the house like no big deal, and just came on up the stairs without saying a word. No knocking, no doorbell. The dogs didn't bark. Nothing. So we got spooked, jumped, screamed, and we shit our pants a little when we hear a man start talking behind us. We don't know how long he had been in the house. We don't know how long he stood behind us without speaking. But when he did speak, we shook. Well, well, well. 
I didn't know I was getting a two-for-one deal, he said quietly in a gravelly low voice. He chuckled as we stood there in shock of the stranger in her room. He sauntered over to us like a man on a Sunday walk. The smell of cigarettes filled the room, as if Rod Serling himself was standing in the corner explaining our situation to the audience for, of course, an own personal episode of The Twilight Zone. Right then, I noticed how much this guy looked like the guy in the pictures that Shelly showed us, except he had a salt and a pepper, not jet black hair. His eyes were not ice blue, but black, not brown, black. It looked like this guy was 100% pupil. Are you... I was interrupted by Shelly shouting, who got hurt? She must have thought we were horsing around and one of us got hurt. This was normal for us because we goofed around a lot. She was jolted at the sight of this man blocking her from us. He turned around just as soon as she reached the top of the stairs and held his arms out and said, in a way less low tone than he used earlier, Shelly, you look beautiful. I knocked and nobody answered. I hope it's okay. I let myself in. These are your girls, right? They're beautiful, just like their mommy. I will never forget how he said mommy. It felt dirty. B and I both side-eyed each other and then stepped down off of our stepladders. We were both very in tune with each other. It felt weird. I knew she did as well. And we both felt the odd air of the room. Shelley glanced away from him and to us who were behind him, looking at her with wide eyes, both kind of shaking our heads side to side in disbelief. Shelley looked back to him. This exchange only took a few seconds, but it seemed honestly like an eternity. She forced a smile at him and said, Oh, I'm sorry. Next time just ring the bell. I'll come open the door for you. He nodded and walked towards her with open arms and hugged her like they had been the oldest of friends. She looked at us as they hugged, and just kind of rolled her eyes to show us what she thought of his excuse. She proceeded to tell him that it was not appropriate as she let him down the stairs. We then heard him apologize over and over again. B and I instantly ran to our phones. We agreed to text her mom what he had just said to us so we could tell her, without him, of course, knowing about it. We hit send, and about 10 minutes later, we hear footsteps up the stairs. It was Shelly, and she shut the door behind her and asked us if we were okay. She hugged us and told us she was so sorry he made us feel uncomfortable. She explained to us that he said we reminded us of his girls and didn't mean to scare us. We nodded, and then she said they were leaving out for the date. We hugged her. She said to be safe, and we would see her soon. As she headed down the stairs, B and I looked at each other again. We both knew that something just wasn't right, but were both speechless from the good scare that we received from this dark man just about 15 minutes prior. We then heard them walking and talking and heading towards the front door a few minutes later. Shelly shouted up the stairs that she loved us. We yelled back that we loved her, and then the door shut. We instantly started talking over each other saying the same things. B spoke over me. He laid that charm on so thick as soon as he saw mom. B exclaimed further, and did you see his eyes? What the hell was that? He looked so much like the guy from the pictures, but not exactly. We both concurred on our feelings about this stranger, his scent, his demeanor, his voice. He was like something out of a classic stranger danger advert. Again, we agreed to text Shelly how we felt. She thanked us and told us it seemed to be going well and she would let us know that she was safe every hour. B and I just were freaked out, and even more so that Shelly was not. It was like a weird spell he cast on her. It was odd, but we wanted to think the best for Shelly as she was excited about this guy. She texted us every hour until she got home. Her last text said, I'm okay, but officially freaked out, and I'm coming home now. Be home soon. We got freaked out and paced around until we saw headlights pull into the driveway. 
It had been about five hours since she left, and about an hour since that last text message. We were inside with the lights off watching through the side window, trying not to be seen when the motion sensor light flooded the yard and light fell onto the driveway. A truck flew into the driveway. The passenger side door flung open just before the truck was at a full stop, and Shelly's feet were on the pavement just as fast. She waved at the driver and kind of jogged at the door wide-eyed. She reached the front door, turned, and waved the truck off. She had her house key ready in the hand she wasn't moving with. She unlocked the door and slid inside the safety of the house. Keep the lights off. Let's go upstairs, Shelly said as she locked the two deadbolts and the chain. Not once did she look at us. We headed up the stairs behind her. We walked into B's room and looked out the window, down to the truck. It was still parked out front with the lights on and engine running. As we all stared at the truck, Shelly told us of the ordeal that she went through. Long story short, he had made reservations at the wrong restaurant, so he suggested they go buy some food and have a picnic-style dinner at a local park. The thing is, Shelly didn't do well outdoors. She was an office woman, so she declined. However, he had just drove so long to get there and then hit her with, you kind of owe me, and Shelly said that made her feel bad, knowing he drove two hours. So when he mentioned that he had a vacation home that he could cook for her at a close by location, she agreed. She said they got to the house and it was nice enough. Log cabin near Bethel, New York, only about 35 minutes from our town. Shelly said he kept talking about how easy it was to get her alone. He also kept saying he liked strong mommies because they have such fight, but she caved. This made her skin crawl. This wasn't the man she thought of originally. This also wasn't the man in the picture, and Shelly started to slowly realize this. Shelly then said she asked for a ride home due to her feeling ill. He wasn't the happiest, but he complied and stopped cooking and started looking for the key she knew he had in his pocket. He then started asking her about our girls, referring to myself and B. This freaked Shelly out so bad that she said she was going to get someone to get her and that he didn't like that he found his keys instantly. Once they were out of the house and in the truck, the truck would not start, so they had to move to his work truck. Shelly was visibly shaken and wouldn't take her eyes off the truck in the driveway as she spilled the story out to us, post haste. She said there was a garage that they said they had to walk around the house to hop into the work truck. She said she felt she had no choice but to play it cool and just agree to go. She hopped out and walked around the house and there indeed was another garage with a truck in it. The same truck that we were already currently staring at just sitting in the driveway. It smelled like bleach and metal, Shelly whispered. She told us on the way home he kept asking about us. What did we do that she didn't like and what got us spankings? What were the naughty things we got in trouble for? What would she do without us? And the one question to scare you out of your pants as a parent. Would you sacrifice yourself for our girls? Shelly said she stared at him in awe and disbelief. And then he just laughed. She got more and more concerned as she noticed her surroundings in the back of the truck that she was riding home in. There were what she thought were chains in a bucket sitting on a desk that was drilled into the floor, a duffel bag, and very large metal objects that she wasn't too sure of. This is when he started to pull out pictures on his little flip phone that had pictures of us. He must have gotten the pictures from Shelly's social media and he took pictures of our pictures and had them on his phone. Waving it around, he told Shelly what a good strong mommy she was and how much of a strong mommy she had been to us. He also continued on by saying she should be proud of what she had accomplished. By this time, they were pulling into the driveway and Shelly was done with his shit. 
She was just about finished when we saw the truck lights turn off. Shelly immediately picked up the phone and dialed the sheriff and told them quickly that there was an unwelcomed person outside the home. Being in such a small town, the sheriff not only went to school and graduated with Shelly, but only lived three doors down. Just as we see this guy getting out of his truck with a duffel bag, we saw the sheriff whip up behind him. This man panicked and literally threw his duffel bag into the truck and tried to back into the sheriff to get out. When he realized he was blocked from the rear, he went through the yard. We could not believe our eyes. The truck peeled out, taking some of the lawn with it. The sheriff came to the door to check on us and told us he had units down the road waiting for him. We all shared a good collective cry and rejoiced in our safety. It did, however, create some paranoia issues in the next couple of weeks due to the fact that we didn't know how long he was in the house when he just let himself in. Did he put cameras anywhere? Did he mess with food in the house to hurt someone? I mean, it was bad, but we worked through it. We never heard anything about him getting caught, but we did occasionally later on receive eerie messages on Facebook, two of which we know were him, but we put that out of our minds. We haven't heard anything from or about him since about three months after the incident when the last message was received. It's now been about 11 years since the incident, but we still talk about it when we can. So, old dude from eHarmony, let's not ever, ever meet again. By the way, feel free to ask questions about anything I might have missed or didn't explain well enough. This is legitimately my first post on Reddit, so let me know if I didn't answer a question well enough. So, I, 33-year-old female, live at a funeral home, which is owned and run by my dad. I live in the apartment upstairs, and I do some side work for my dad, but I don't work for the funeral home itself. Since I live here though, I tend to interact with a lot of people who are here for funeral related things and whatnot. I represent my dad when I'm speaking to someone here, so I'm always nice and helpful. I had a couple of crazy people I've dealt with, but Nothing like this. By the way, this was sometime in mid-March, because it was right to the beginning of the whole COVID takeover. I had gone to pick up some food for my family around 6pm. Unless, of course, there is a service. The employees are usually gone, and I believe it was a Saturday as well. So, I pull into my parking lot, and as I park, a car drives by me going towards the entrance side. It was a dark SUV. And there are also so many people who work here who have similar vehicles that I couldn't see from that far who it was, but I gave a quick wave, thinking it was somebody that I knew. This was a bad idea. So the car stops, and the guy gets out. But like I said, I'm used to having to help people and tell them where they can drop things off or pick stuff up, etc. So this guy gets out, and then comes toward my car. I rolled my window down a little bit, expecting to just say hello and to tell him that nobody is working here right now. He comes right over to my window and starts leaning in and peering into my car, which was a red flag already. It was very invasive after all. I'm glad my doors were locked and I only put it down a little bit. So this dude basically had his head in my car and it creeped me out, but before anything else, his eyes scared the crap out of me. He was very, very pale, with bright red hair, and his eyes were literally the craziest and scariest eyes I have ever seen in my life. It was chilling. I don't know if he was on drugs or just plain crazy, but I'm already uncomfortable at this point. So he starts to talk to me and he asks me if I work here, blah blah blah. I tell him no one is working. Please call tomorrow in the morning, and you can speak to someone then. I thought that was going to be it, but it wasn't even close. This man came to bring an application to my father to work for the funeral home. He was apparently in IT or something, 
but he had studied embalming and also volunteered for the Red Cross. He was talking a mile a minute and I was so incredibly uncomfortable, but even more so when he started to tell me about how certain embalming techniques he studied included hanging cadavers by their feet and other insane sick stuff. He had absolutely no experience in embalming though. He cornered me in my car for 15 minutes and just rambled. I told him several times, please just call tomorrow morning and I really can't help you. So now I'm sitting here in my car with this insane man outside my vehicle and I also had food on my seat. He was looking into my car so he saw it. You would think he would take the hint. At some point I texted my husband and said, come outside now. Thank God he actually saw my text message and came out. So he comes up to this guy and he was like, can I help you? The guy starts cornering my husband also. This guy had absolutely no idea what personal space was and my husband kept backing up and he would move in closer every single time. I took an opportunity to grab the food and get out since he was outside. When I got out, he started telling my husband and I, this virus is going around and there are going to be bodies piling up. They're going to need extra help here when there are hundreds of bodies dead. It almost seemed like he was excited at that thought. He had a resume and I told him multiple times to please bring it by again. I didn't even want to touch anything he had but he forced it into my husband's hands. I went to the stairs and gave my husband a concerned look and motioned for him to come in. This guy made me so extremely nervous and I didn't want my husband out there any longer. But this guy was almost impossible to walk away from. He did not understand that it was done. So eventually we got away from this freak and we got inside. I immediately called my dad to explain what happened and to warn him of this guy. I told my dad I'd never felt more uncomfortable in my life before and there was something seriously wrong with this dude. I wanted to warn him that he would probably be back the next day and oh you best believe he came back. A couple of days later, mid morning, I'm upstairs in my apartment and there are several employees in the office upstairs. I hear somebody ring the doorbell once, twice, three times. He then proceeded to ring it non-stop for 15 minutes. They assumed it was him and they didn't answer. I went out and I was like, what the hell is with the doorbell? They knew it was him apparently because he had called earlier and wanted to talk to my dad and one of the employees told him we aren't hiring but he insisted on talking to my father so he came by. Then after the doorbell went off for several minutes, the phone started ringing off the hook. Next, he was going around to all the windows and pounding on them relentlessly. I had told him how crazy he was but I was glad they could now see what I meant and that I wasn't overreacting. Eventually, my older brother went down with a mask on. Like I said, this was right in the beginning and people weren't even wearing masks regularly but this guy had no boundaries. He then cornered my brother the same way and would not let him leave and end the conversation either. We were all just thinking, what the hell is wrong with this guy? My dad did not want to talk to him but he wouldn't give up. Next day he comes back again, same thing, banging on the windows and ringing the bell, calling relentlessly. Eventually my dad's secretary answered the phone and put him in his place and told him if he called again, they would call the cops. The best part is that every time he did show up, he showed up in full top to bottom biker gear, spandex, helmet, knee pads, even though he apparently lived a few streets over. This guy was absolutely nuts. I'm so thankful he has not come back. So psycho eyed a biker dude, let's not meet ever again. One time, I went to the bar with one of my friends. I just turned 21 years old, so I haven't been to many bars up to that point in my life. My friend was drinking on the way to the bar, so he was already pretty drunk when we got there. 
When I sat at the bar, a cute girl came and talked to me and my friend. She said her name was Candace, and I noticed she had really, really bright red hair. I assumed that she dyed it. It was pretty, but unnatural. Anyway, this girl was flirting with me and my friend. She could tell my friend was already very drunk. To be honest, I played along with it like I was drunk already too since it seemed to be working for my friend. I didn't know if she was just trying to get free drinks, so I told her we didn't have much money. She offered to buy us drinks. She kept buying us drinks and I started to get confused as to who she liked between me and my friend. My friend went to the bathroom. Before he came back, he was kicked out by the bouncers. He was too drunk. Candace and I went outside with him. She kept telling him to go home with her. He was so out of it he could barely answer her though, however. I told her he was too drunk and that I couldn't let him go anywhere. I didn't want him to wake up hungover in some random house with no car and no idea of what happened. Candace, however, kept pushing it, saying that she would take care of him, but I told her no because I had to stay with him. I was more sober than him and he was my responsibility. I told her the only way he was going anywhere was if I tagged along. I assumed that she thought I was jealous or cock blocking but my friend could barely stand and lost interest in Candace already at this point. She immediately started flirting with me and offered to get my friend a taxi to drive him home and said we could go to her place alone. At this point I had a few drinks and I was pretty buzzed so I agreed. We took my friend to the taxi and then walked to her car. I slightly stumbled on the way to her vehicle. Wow, you're pretty drunk, huh? She said, smiling as she had held onto my arm. Yeah, I said. I don't know why, but I just felt slightly shy and anxious. Everything was just happening way too easy for me, so I felt uneasy. We got in her car and we drove down the street. Want to stop at the liquor store and get some more to drink? I'll buy it so don't worry about paying, she offered. I didn't want to drink any more than I already did. I was already buzzed and wanted to be able to carry myself throughout the rest of the evening. Sometimes I made myself look stupid when I'm drunk so I didn't want to ruin anything with Candace more than I already did earlier with telling her my friend was too drunk. I told her I was already drunk enough but she insisted. I didn't want to seem lame so I told her to get me a pint of liquor with some apple juice to chase it. She went into the store and came out with a lot more than just a pint. I assumed she wanted to drink more also and that's why she got a fifth instead of a pint. On the car ride we passed the bottle back and forth but she took tiny sips. I tried to take tiny sips but she kept passing me the bottle and telling me to drink. I somehow managed to drink all of my apple juice and pretended to drink the bottle by spitting the liquor in the apple juice bottle. I tossed the apple juice bottle full of liquor out the window before she saw it. I didn't want her to know I was acting drunker than I was. She actually believed I was sloppy drunk when I was simply buzzed. I took a couple of more sips of liquor and I finished the bottle. Throughout the car ride I called her the wrong name a couple of times so I could get a reaction out of her. She didn't react to it. She just kept letting me call her Carla without correcting me. I mean, for some reason, I thought she lied to me about her name initially. We drove up to her house, and I pretended to trip and stumble into her front door. She helped me walk inside by holding me up. She then opened her front door, which was unlocked. We walked in her house. She closed her front door, and then locked it. I thought that was strange, but assumed she didn't want anyone walking in on us. I told her that I had to use the bathroom. So I walked into her bathroom, locked the door, and looked in the mirror. I just felt strange. I felt like something was off. I felt myself becoming more drunk from finishing the bottle earlier. I turned on the sink to make noise and I made myself puke up the liquor I drank. I flushed and went to the sink and started drinking the tap water out of my hands to sober up. I just didn't want to be drunk, but I still wanted to hook up with Candace, so I wanted to pretend to be drunk. I turned the sink off, and I could hear her talking to someone. He's drunk as hell. 
He can barely stand up. You do it. Who was she talking to? And do what? I walked out of the bathroom and into the living room. The moment I stepped into the living room, I saw her walking into another room. All I could see was the back of her head. The strange, very bright red hair go into another room. But I didn't see her face or anything. I just saw her kind of walk fast into the room. The living room was pretty dark. Hey, where are you going? I slurred like I was drunk. She walked back into the dark living room and up to me and said, Let's go in my room, she said. I looked at her bright red hair and then into her eyes. They were different. Her face was different. It was another girl with the same hair. That's when I realized it was another girl with the same wig on. It was a wig the whole time. She had changed it with the girl from earlier for whatever reason. My heart felt like it stopped, but I tried to look like I had no idea it was a different girl. I kind of smiled at her and told her I just needed to use the bathroom one more time and told her sorry I was so drunk. She said, it's fine, just hurry up in there. I went into the bathroom and I locked the door. I heard her whisper something to someone again. This time, I think I heard a male voice whisper back. I honestly didn't concentrate on listening to exactly what she said. Something sketchy was definitely going on and I had to get out of that house fast. I opened the bathroom window and I jumped straight out of it and ran faster than I have ever ran in my entire life. I didn't look behind myself or anything at all. I just ran through the backyard, jumped the fence, ran through someone else's backyard, hit a road, and I ran toward the main road. I kept running down the main road until I saw a 24-hour convenience store. I ran into this store and I stood straight at the front of the store, in front of the camera. I then called a taxi and I went home. I tried to think about what happened that night. What was she or they planning that night? Why did she tell me a fake name? Why was she trying to get my friend and I so drunk? I thought maybe a robbery, but she kept spending money on us. She kept buying us drinks and even paid for my friend's taxi cab. And, mostly, why did she wear a wig that she gave to another girl to wear? Who was she talking to? What did it mean? And what was in that room they tried to lure me into? Edit. The next day after this incident, I went back to the house with a couple of friends to see just what was going on. Nobody was there. No cars. No people. Nothing. Just an empty house. I ended up finding out that the house was a summer rental, and whoever those people were, they broke into that house and used it only for that night, and they never came back. A little bit of backstory. I'm a 20 year old, short petite female working at a subway, and I can't help but be nice to anyone even if they creep me out. I feel bad usually. About a year ago we had this guy, 35 to 45 years old, who would come in every day for lunch. He was fascinated by my stretched ears and a few piercings I had on my face and always asked questions. He would sit down after I rang him out and would watch me from his table for two hours non-stop, just staring at me while I helped other customers. This goes on for about two weeks. Every day he would ask for my number, saying he has plugs and tunnels he wants to give me and to see me wearing them in my ears, and I always politely declined. One day, I'm alone in the store because my manager had to run to the bank. We were really slow that day, so I was just in the back room messing around on my phone. I heard the door chime, looked up, and yet no one was there. Then I saw the man walk past the front of the store really quickly, like he was in a hurry. Then, the store phone rings. Me. Thanks for calling Subway. How can I help you? Him. This is the girl with the nice ears, right? Me. Uh, yeah, who is this? Him. Are you alone in the back room right now? Are you working by yourself? At this point, I got really creeped out and I knew it was him. 
I hung up and texted my manager the situation so she could hurry back. He called again, this time asking me very weird questions, like what I would do with them in a room with the door locked, if I had a boyfriend, why I was playing hard to get, etc. My manager gets back and I tell her everything. In the middle of the lunch rush, he calls again. This time my manager answers and to this day she never told me what he said, but the look on her face made my spine shiver. She told him if he called again or showed up here, she was going to call the police. I thought that was the end of it, but alas I was wrong. One week later, I'm clocking out and getting ready to walk to my car parked in the front, and when I look outside, I see him standing by my car and looking inside of it. I was an idiot and I left the back door unlocked. I then watched him crawl inside and shut the door. The creep was trying to hide in my back seat and do God knows what to me when I got in. My manager locked the front door of our store and then called the police. When they arrived, they had to pretty much drag him out of my car and he was arrested. On him was a butcher knife, rope, and a rag with chloroform on it. If I hadn't looked up when I did, I would most likely be dead right now. So, Subway Stalker, let's not ever meet again. When I was 18 years old, I worked at my college's residence building at the front desk, and I think I almost got assaulted, or even murdered. You be the judge. During the summer, the building operated as a hotel, so two and a half floors were hotel rooms, and half of the third floor were student rooms. The whole building operated with a hotel swipe key system. That was pretty outdated, and all the doors were powered by four AA batteries. If the batteries died, there was a decently lengthy process to replace them and also reprogram the door. A dark-haired guy came to the front desk from inside the building while I was working an overnight shift at around 1 or 2 a.m. and he said he left his key card in his room. I made him a new one and made my first error of the evening. Hotel guests could have as many room keys remade as they wanted, hypothetically. The students, however, were supposed to be given a temporary key card themselves and charged two dollars to be returned when theirs is located. I give him a new key for his room and asked if he was a student or a hotel guest, and he replied, student. At this point, I should have checked our system to charge his account, but I was caught up doing administrative duties and forgot to do that. I used to trust people way too easily at this job, but quickly learned not to. Later on in the night, maybe around 3 or 4 a.m., he came to the desk again and said he couldn't get into his room. I asked if he just forgot his key again, and he said no, the door wasn't working. I asked if the light was coming on when he swiped his card, and he said no, so I figured the batteries were dead. I told him I'd have to change the batteries myself, and I went up to his room with him. He asked me for my name, and I told him. He didn't tell me his. Anyway, I opened the room door manually with a master key and told them I'd have to prop it open while I worked on the back panel to replace the batteries. He said, no, it's okay, I'll close it, and closed and dead bolted the door locked. Really weird, but I tried not to think about it. I had changed the batteries on plenty of other doors by this point, and as some students were iffy about having the doors propped open for their room to be on display for anybody walking by. He also had a really thick accent, and I thought he might be an international student, since we had a lot of students from other countries, where English was not their first language. I gave him the benefit of the doubt, and thought maybe it was also just a language barrier issue. At this point though, I really felt like something was wrong, but I tried to ignore it so I didn't freak him out. While I was trying to focus on fixing the door as quickly as possible, he kept trying to entice me to go further into the room, saying his bed was broken 
and he needed me to take a look at it. There was something underneath that needed to be fixed, etc. He held out the little gold house key and said, I have a key, go get it, and threw it under the bed. He said there was a leak under the fridge as well. He just kept trying to get me down on the ground, throwing random problems at me. Obviously, I told him no. I'd send maintenance up in the morning to take a look at it if anything was broken. I had my back to him and he asked me if I would take off my glasses. I said, no, I need them to see. His tone of voice changed, and in the most steadily chilling manner, he said, Ella, it's okay. You can take them off. And from behind me, he reached around and tried to take off my glasses. I swatted his hand away, and trying to keep my composure, I said, no thanks, I need to keep them on. Even though he was creeping me out, I didn't want to be rude to him. I didn't want to get in trouble if he complained about me, or risk upsetting him and having him yell at me. I got up to grab something from the door repair kit and undid the door deadbolt and opened it up in the process. He jumped toward the door to close it again and told me to keep it closed. I told him no, I had to open it to start reprogramming it from the front. While I held the door open with my foot and grabbed something from the door repair kit, he started playing with the little wispy hairs at the top of my forehead and trying to touch my shoulder. I swatted him away again and asked him not to touch me and focused on getting out of there. He once again tried getting me to follow him into the bedroom, saying the bed was broken, and I went as far as the door frame to see if I could spot any actual problem with his bed. This is when I realized that he had nothing in his room, no dishes in the kitchen, no shower curtain in the bathroom, no sheets on the bed, nothing. This wasn't his room. My brain once again went back to the international student theory, thinking he had just arrived today and hadn't gotten a chance to buy anything yet. But in the pit of my stomach, I knew that something was off. I fiddled around with the door for a few more seconds before announcing that it was fixed and quickly gathered the door kit and left. Before I, however, had the chance to reach the elevator, he came back out without his shoes to follow me. He tried to get back in to get his shoes and called out, Ella, the door, it isn't fixed, you need to come back. I went back and opened the door manually and told him if the door was broken, I'd have to send up maintenance to fix it in the morning. I knew he was going to follow me to the elevator again, so I closed the door behind me once he went inside and ran down the stairwell as fast as I could. When I got to the front desk, I checked the computer and saw that the room he was in was supposed to be empty. It wasn't a student room or even a hotel room. I locked myself in our back office and then proceeded to call campus security. He came down a few minutes later and went behind the desk. I yelled back at him to get on the other side and wait. Now that I knew he wasn't actually a resident, he tore the corner off a slip of paper that I had sitting on the desk and drew a flower on it, then put it back on top of my papers. When security arrived, he ran back up to the empty room and tried convincing them he lived there so he wouldn't have to leave. He kept showing them his key, which I decided to work on the door again somehow. They escorted him back downstairs and came to ask me if he really did live there. Obviously, he didn't. That's why I called you guys crying and terrified. He kept interjecting to argue that he did live there, but couldn't even recall his room number when asked. The security asked him for his student card, and of course he couldn't produce it. So they told him he would have to leave if he couldn't prove he lived there. While they were grabbing his information, I listened from the office, and I could immediately tell that he was lying. The phone number he gave was just a bunch of random numbers. The name he gave was prefixed by, um, as if he was trying to think of a name. When they asked him for his address, he just said, across the street. One security guard asked if he lived in the apartments across the street, and he said, 
Yes, but couldn't tell them what building number it was. He said his apartment number was 1200, but I moved into that building a few months later and apartment 1200 doesn't exist. When security asked what his purpose was to be sneaking into a room, he just kept up with the ums and uh and saying he didn't know. They'd ask, were you trying to see a friend? Do you know anybody who lives here? Were you here to hurt somebody? And he kept fidgeting and saying, I don't know, no reason, I was just here. At one point he tried to tell them he was my friend. At which point I poked my head out of the office to say that I literally had never seen him before that night. He left. We didn't call the police because he didn't actually do anything, but it was still unsettling. Later on, it dawned on me how he figured out that room was vacant. One of the housekeepers had been using it as her personal break room. A few days later, a housekeeper came to the desk and told me they found the door dead bolted open, the TV on, and a housekeeper inside watching TV. She must have forgotten to close the door when she left for the night, and when the creep let himself into the building, he found it. I never saw him again, and to this day I have no clue what he was doing there. I haven't worked there since last winter, and overnight shifts still give me the heebie-jeebies. When I was a teenager, my older brother moved out and my parents both worked late, so occasionally I would spend evenings by myself after school. We lived in the countryside a few miles outside of town and we had a good collection of neighbors. The day went as normally as ever. I went to school, got home, turned on the television, had a snack, and texted one of my friends who I had a crush on. It wasn't long afterward that I noticed a man outside my house. He walked past a few times. Now he wasn't an ordinary person walking around the block. He looked scraggly and unkept. I ducked as far as I could behind a chair, still trying to see him out the living room windows, hoping that he didn't see me. But soon, he came to the front door and knocked. I was texting my friend the entire time increasingly getting freaked out. As he knocked on the door, I stupidly went to answer. I had my phone on me with 911 at the ready. I tried to silently unlock the door to not alert the man. I opened the door a crack. There was a screen door separating myself and the man. I was ready to slam the door and lock it if anything happened. The man looked at me with crazed, paranoid eyes. He had a large dark beard and looked to be late 50s, early 60s. He seemed out of breath and his face drenched with sweat. He was larger too, more the reason to keep my guard up. Then I sheepishly said, Hello? Please, call the police, they're after me, he said in an exhausted smoker voice. He kept looking at the road and tensed whenever a car would occasionally pass. Who's after you? I asked getting ready to slam the door. I barely escaped. They were right behind me. Please, can I come inside? At this, I knew to call the police. Just wait here. I'll get someone to help. My heart was in my throat at this time. I didn't know if this guy was then going to try and force open the door, so I quickly shut it and locked it. I then ran to the back door and locked that as well as I called 911. My heart was racing and I could barely tell the operator my information, but they said they would send somebody out anyway. It wasn't long until a patrol car arrived, but it felt like forever. The entire time I kept watching the man, who then walked into my driveway, pacing nervously. The officer got out and proceeded to talk with the man, and they got in the car and left. I have no idea what happened to him, nor if he was telling me the truth. He could have been drunk or crazy, but it was genuine fear in his eyes when I looked at him. Something truly scared him, and it scared me to think there could be someone out there that wanted people for whatever reason. So, for the crazed, scared man 
whoever he was running from, let's not meet. Before I begin, I should state this was a few years ago, and I'm a tiny woman. Back at this time, I looked like a teenager, so I've always been mindful that I seem an easier target, or easier to fool. I had seen a job interview for a small business looking for a secretary. No experience needed, as they would provide the on-job training, and as that's the kind of thing I was looking for, I applied. I heard back quickly and was invited for an interview. When I arrived, I was excited. It was a bit of a journey from my home, but it was in a beautiful old building on the third floor with a modern layout inside, though you could tell it was very new as it was bare bones and very little had been unpacked. Still though, if you have to work somewhere, might as well be in a nice building, right? Anyway. The interview seemed normal. I only encountered female members of staff, and they were all warm and lovely. The woman interviewing me was amazing, and even sat talking to me for a while after getting to know me. When I got home, I wasn't in the door long before I got a phone call from them. I nailed the interview. Awesome, I thought, and I was offered the job. I was about to accept when I was told on the phone, Okay. You'll come here tomorrow, and we'll have the van drive you to where you'll be working. And I was like, uh, what? Confused about what they meant. They then told me I'd be meeting with customers on their behalf, and talking, selling stuff. I was not comfortable with this as it wasn't what I was interviewed for, but I gave them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they had a second position they thought it fit better in with. It wouldn't be that weird as a new company, and while not what I was comfortable with, I should hear them out. So, I ask more questions, and the woman on the other end of the line is getting more snippy and tense. Gone was the nice, friendly woman from earlier, and she was not to reveal where I would be going or who I would be meeting. By this point, plenty of red flags were going off, so I said no thanks to her offer. For anyone curious about what happened afterward, I reported this as it seemed very dodgy, but when they were checked in on the floor, it was no longer occupied by them. They'd apparently just rented it for a week, and they were gone. So, to the people who interviewed me, let's not meet again. A girl called Laura. When I was 10 years old, I lived in a relatively small town in Texas, in a small house with my mother. My mother has always had a very caring heart for those in need. So when my uncle called her one night and told her he ran into a homeless girl at the local park, my mom offered to help her out for a day or so just to get her back on her feet. That sort of thing. When the girl arrived at my house, she said her name was Laura. Laura told us she was 16 at the time. She seemed like a shy girl. When my mother asked what she was doing out on the streets, Laura told us she had been kicked out of her home by her mother because her mother had accused her of sleeping with her boyfriend. Laura told us that allegation wasn't true. She told us her mother's boyfriend was the one who came on to her. My mom gave Laura a place to sleep in the guest bedroom that night. The following day after breakfast, Laura asked to use my mom's house phone so she could call her mom. That was so of course she could get some of her things from her mom's house. Laura's mom never answered the phone and we felt bad for her. As a 10 year old girl, I couldn't imagine what she must have been going through. Later that day, I remember watching TV in the living room and minding my own business but I could feel someone staring at me, so I turned my head where I felt the gaze. Laura was sending me a glare so cold that it looks like it could kill me. I would have dropped dead right there. I was confused and I was a little bit scared. I turned my head away from her quickly and went back to watching television, but I could still feel Laura's cold gaze. I couldn't understand what I had done to her to cause her to look at me with such hate. 
The following day, it happened once more. I was in the kitchen getting a glass of water when I could feel someone looking at me. I turned my head to the side and I saw Laura's head appearing around the corner at me. Her eyes were dark and laced with hatred. It frightened me and I felt so confused as to why she was looking at me like this. I didn't want to cause any trouble so I didn't bring up Laura's death glares to my mother at all. Later that night, my uncle joined us for dinner. He had stopped by to see how everything was with Laura and if we had any luck finding her a place to live with one of her family members. After dinner, I was washing my plate in the sink when I heard a loud growling sound come from the dining room. I turned my head to see Laura shaking and growling like some sort of wild animal. My mom and uncle looked disturbed and worried. Laura threw herself onto the floor and then began thrashing around and screaming as if she was possessed. I was absolutely terrified. It was a scary thing to witness as a 10 year old. I grew up very religious. My mom and uncle began praying out loud for Laura while I ran to my room and closed the door. This went on for about two hours, but it felt like an eternity of horror. I could hear Laura screaming like a madwoman and growling like some sort of deranged beast. I don't think any of us knew exactly what was going on. After my mom and uncle had prayed for Laura for what felt like forever, Laura told us she was free from an evil demon that had taken over her. None of us were sure what had caused her behavior. None of us were even sure what even happened. I peeked my head out of my room and I see Laura is smiling happily while she curled up on the couch with a blanket. Her eyes opened and she shot a cold glare at me. I quickly closed my bedroom door in fear and I placed a chair in front of my bedroom door and I went to sleep. I woke up the next morning by my mom waking me up. She told me that she was taking me out to eat at my favorite restaurant. When I asked her if Laura was going, she gave me a serious expression and she spoke. Your uncle is going to take Laura back to her mom's house. He slept on the couch last night after what happened. He and I were talking when the two of you had gone to sleep and we pieced together that Laura made the entire performance up last night. She said, she is not stable and we think that she's dangerous. As I heard my mother say those words, relief washed over me. I got dressed and went to the car so I could go to the restaurant with my mom. When we got into the car, we saw Laura and my uncle getting in his truck with her. Laura looked angry. Her expression was of a child's when you don't give them what they want. Anyway, she got into my uncle's car and they drove away. I'm now 22 years old and I've never forgotten about this horrific incident that happened in my life all those years ago. After that day, I never saw Laura or heard anything else about her ever again. I recently received a friend request that reminded me of this story, so I'm going to share it here. This happened after I went to university, so I was 18 years old. I made an effort to make friends after I moved on to campus and ended up with a few groups to hang out with, including a new girlfriend and plenty of people from my classes that I liked well enough. There was one class before lunch where it was traditional for people to go to the cafeteria afterwards so they could eat in pairs or threes. I wasn't very discerning about who I'd have lunch with because I got on fine with most people from the class and we were all trying to make an effort to be social. So when one girl, Lily, asked if I wanted to eat lunch together after that class, I didn't have any reason not to go. We talked about school and that kind of thing. Nothing noteworthy, but she did ask me to get lunch with her again the next week. It became a pattern and there wasn't exactly a way to start saying no suddenly. It was fine, but it did mean I lost the chance to eat lunch with anyone else on those days. 
In hindsight, I suppose that was the point. One day in class, I asked someone if I could add them on social media. This happened in front of Lily. I saw her face jerk towards me from a couple of seats over. It was a sharp reaction that it was hard to ignore it, and I still remember. By the time I got home later that day, Lily had sent me a friend request. No friends in common, by the way. I don't know how she knew my last name. I was a bit surprised. But I guess she just dug through the university's social media pages and found me through there. It gave me a bad feeling. But surely it was fine, right? She ended up messaging me a lot and commenting on anything I posted. I told myself that she was just awkward and we became friends. If not close. I'd known worse people in my life. She still always got me to go eat lunch with her after our one shared class. Other than that, we rarely spent time together in person. I saw her around sometimes, but I never went out of my way to hang out with her. So, it was mostly online messaging and seeing each other in group settings. Coincidentally, my girlfriend was also named Lily. This was something that clearly bothered Lily, not my girlfriend, who couldn't have found it less interesting. It is a common name after all. She occasionally hinted that she wanted my girlfriend to pick a different name, or joked about her not suiting it. She clearly didn't like my girlfriend at all, and I had an idea of why. It was hard to ignore by this point. Lily was starting to hint that she had a crush on me. I tried not to address it, because what was I going to say? I've never known what to do when a friend makes a pass at me. I was also not interested in the least, even ignoring the weird stuff that she pulled. Lily was not my type at all. She tended to dress and act in a way where it was somewhere between a fitness housewife and one of those adults who is still obsessed with Disney princesses, if you can picture that. Things took an uncomfortable turn on the day of our last shared class of the year. Instead of asking me to lunch like she usually did, Lily asked if I'd go for a walk with her. Again, I didn't exactly know how to refuse, so I said, okay. Our campus was bordered by a large patch of woodland. Lily led me into the woods, and the sounds of our fellow students slowly faded away. She sat down on a log and... I joined her. She started talking about how she was going to miss me over the summer. I did try placating her, but I didn't want to be there, especially because she seemed almost on the verge of tears. I think I tried to make an excuse about having plans with my girlfriend, but before I could leave, Lily chose to kiss me without warning. It was so uncomfortable to say the least. I got out of there and was happy to think I wouldn't see her for a while. I came back to university after the summer, moving into a house with my friends. Now, without going off topic, there were some serious issues in my friend group, a lot of petty arguing, and worse. I broke up with my girlfriend around the start of that school year as well. Basically, the whole mess made me recontextualize things with Lily, because it suddenly didn't seem as bad. That said, I didn't want to be alone with her. We mostly spoke online. She was still constantly messaging me after all. One upside of everything was that I started dating a boy. Lily was not pleased to hear that news. I think she hoped to sneak in after I broke up with my girlfriend. But as I said before, that was never going to happen. There wasn't a big gap between my breakup and this new relationship, so she must have thought she'd missed her chance to be with me. This is where the story gets bad. At this time, I was fairly active on Tumblr. I occasionally talked about my life, and mostly reblogged photos and stuff. I was on there one day when something odd happened. One of the blogs I followed had received an ask with some phrases that I recognized. It took a second to register that it was taken from my about page. That is what made me freeze. I read the message properly. 
someone was asking this completely random person to analyze a section of text from my page, asking for their opinion on the type of person who would write it. Now, the thing is, I cannot stress how messed up it was to see people talking about me like I was a character in a book they were trying to study. The reply was basically, I don't know, sorry. But the important thing was that the question hadn't been anonymous. It linked to somebody's blog. Obviously, I wanted to know who had taken such a bizarre interest in me. As far as I knew, no one in real life, other than my boyfriend, knew about my page. Well, no prizes for guessing who was behind it. What I found was like a shrine. She was using a fake name, but I recognized Lily all over that thing. It was this cutesy pink and red page. There were few posts about her interests, but most of the content was focused on a primary interest, me. Most of the posts were about me. There were accounts of things I'd done recently. He told me about such and such. He went to a nightclub recently, etc. As well as references to things from as far back as I'd known her. It was clear she had been keeping tabs on me, both online and offline as well. She was gathering up every scrap of information she could about my life and hoarding it here in her collection. She talked about us eating lunch together and how special our dates had been to her, as if it was anything more than acquaintances getting food after class. She talked about the time she had forcibly kissed me in the woods, but she wrote it as if it had been mutual. She quoted the lyrics from my favorite song and talked about how she'd always be there for me no matter who else came into my life. Lots of references to loving me just the way he is which answered another mystery about an anonymous love letter I'd received earlier that year with the same exact wording. Things got worse. There were a lot of posts about my boyfriend as well. These weren't so nice. They got vicious, talking about how he didn't deserve me. He didn't know what he had. If she was with me, she'd be jealous of anyone else who came near me. So my boyfriend not being a jealous person meant that he didn't love me. It was angry and hateful. I didn't like to think about the sort of person who could write so obsessively being fixated on me. One thing that didn't make sense at first was that the blog also made plenty of references to Lily's best friend, Stephen. She had never mentioned this person to me. Her post talked a lot about Stephen and how great of a friend he was. It also went on about how much fun they had together how he looked down for her, etc. I was trying to work out whether this was an online friend when one specific post made it all click. She had posted a photo and captioned it with, Stephen sent this to me. He knew I would like it and love it or something like that. The problem was the photo was taken from my own page. I hadn't sent it to her. She took it from my page and then claimed this fictional best friend of hers shared it with her because in her head, she'd split me into two people. In her messed up fantasy life, I was both a perfect best friend who was always looking out for her and her soulmate who was bound to end up with her when I finally got over my sweet and kind boyfriend and all the other easy girls I hung out with that she made dozens of posts about complaining. Who was she complaining to, you might ask? Huh, Lily had an audience. She'd ask open questions about me and her relationship with me and got messages back from her followers. People who took what she said at face value. I saw a bunch of random people agreeing with this stalker that my boyfriend didn't deserve me and we were bound to break up soon so I could be with Lily, the person I was clearly supposed to be with. She had this fake fan fiction version of my life up for anyone to share their own opinion on and she made herself out to be the hero of it all. I went maybe a month back into this page's history. I did not look at everything that was on there. It was just too much. So I'm not sure how long this had been going on for. I sent Lily a message confronting her about the blog. She said nothing 
and I cannot stress how weird it was to have found pages and pages dedicated to me with her talking about how she was in love with me and would make sure we ended up together, slamming my boyfriend and building a fantasy life with two different versions of me and that she clearly believed to be real, then acting like it hadn't happened. She said nothing. She didn't address it. She just changed the subject, even after I pushed it, and it was like she hadn't even registered what I said. I've never seen anything else like it. She deleted the page, of course, or at least changed the name and hid it so I never found it again. It wasn't the end, though. I wasn't going to hang out with her anymore, but we were still shoved together in classes and she had started to actually scare me with what she might do next. I mean, I kind of am a paranoid person. Now, knowing someone was obsessively keeping track of me for who knows how long really freaked me out. The next thing she pulled was trying to seduce my boyfriend. It was an absolutely useless attempt that only made him uncomfortable. He told me about it right away. What was her plan there? Did she hope to tell me he cheated and waited for me to break up with him? Why would I want her after that? When that didn't work out for her, she tried hitting on the three of my other friends. None of them took the bait. She ended up dating one of my former housemates for a while, but made sure to send me messages while they were together, letting me know she'd rather be with me. Yeah, no thanks. Lily made sure to stay in my life the whole time I was at university. There was a time when I tried to pull away from her, and she ended up starting rumors about me and damaging a career opportunity I'd put a lot of work into. I don't know what else she did behind my back, but it made me realize it was safer to let her think she was part of my life while ignoring her, rather than doing something that was going to cause her to get angry. After I graduated, Lily still wanted to spend time together, but I knew I didn't have to now. I made excuses about work and barely talked to her after that point. I almost entirely stopped posting on social media that I knew she knew about. Of course, she didn't give up that easily. She tried to start conversations, asked me to meet up with her, attempts that I usually ignored. I didn't like to think she was still tracking me online, but she probably most likely was. I don't know how, but she'd occasionally reference things I mentioned online somewhere, somewhere she shouldn't have known about. The last time we had a real conversation, she sent me a message out of nowhere. We hadn't spoken at all in months, and we hadn't talked about anything serious in much longer than that. Thinking about that conversation still makes my skin crawl, but I'll summarize what happened. At first she asked me some questions about how long I'd known I was queer. I told her some basic stuff, the kind of thing I'd tell anyone who asked. Then she changed the subject. She started talking about how I would feel about her if she was a boy, about wanting to be a boy for me. The messages quickly became about fetishes. She went into plenty of detail about fantasies she had of the two of us. Again, we were not friends at this point. We had never been especially close, at least not from my perspective, and we had barely spoken for years. I can't imagine sending messages like that to even a close friend, let alone someone who barely knows you. I tried telling her not to pull this crap with me, but she decided to change her tactics. She sent photos of herself, followed by a bunch of messages, maybe four or five a minute, way too fast for me to reply before the next one arrived. And basically, she was quoting back what I told her about myself and my past earlier. She was telling me these things as if they had happened to her. She was role-playing as me. The worst part was that she seemed to believe it was all real, that those things actually had happened to her, even when she was quoting me word for word. Things I told her only hours before were now her life. It was like she was trying to absorb my history, to take it over, to make my life part of hers. Yeah, I didn't talk to her again after that. I ignored future attempts she made to talk to me, and I eventually silently deleted her from the inactive social media, which was her only real way of contacting me. 
I really thought she might have finally moved on. A few days ago, she sent me a friend request. It's sitting there unanswered, because I know if I delete it, she's only going to send another one. Lily and I met nearly 12 years ago. This story is just the highlights, and even then, it's only the stuff I know about for sure. A lot happened behind my back. I know it did. So, a girl who has spent 12 years obsessing over me, fantasizing about me, stalking me, and harassing me as well. Let's not meet again. The fantasy life that you built for the two of us in your head is the only place that you're going to see me anytime soon. I met Lucy for the first time when she fell asleep on my arm on the bus. When she woke up, she gave me a really weird look before shambling off the bus. I figured she was weirded out that I didn't wake her up sooner, so I kicked myself for being a creep and I went on with my day. I guess you can't really win them all, am I right? I was thrown for a hell of a loop when her whole friend group was sitting by my usual spot on the bus the following day. Being an awkward teen, I wasn't about to turn down any kind of positive attention. I got to know her friends and ended up on good terms with her before I realized that I hadn't asked her her name. I'm hard of hearing, so I didn't hear her when she said her name was Lucy. Right? Yeah. Lucy and I had your typical high school courting process. That is to say she was overwhelmingly forward, and after a few weeks, I got the hint. As we were getting close, Lucy would fixate on learning about past heartbreak and finding out about my personal life as well. I'm a serial oversharer, so I didn't really mind talking about myself, but she would constantly butt in by saying how messed up things were and that she'd kick my friend's ass for hurting me. I was weirded out. Even as a 16 year old, I knew that was cringy. That was going through my emo phase as well. The thing that really bugged me at the time was that she'd ask me so much about me, but she would never say anything about herself. It made me feel shitty, always venting, and never helping her out. During this time, she missed a few days and I let another girl sit by me since it was an overcrowded bus and I didn't think it really mattered. When Lucy came back and saw me with another girl, you'd think she was shot. She just about ran to the seat behind us and started going off. I can't remember what exactly Lucy said, but the other girl never talked to me again after that. Once her rival was gone, Lucy reclaimed her spot next to me and was all sunshine and rainbows. Nobody ever asked to sit in Lucy's spot after that. Lucy always had a crude sense of humor, but after a while things started getting hurtful. She would take jabs at my insecurities and anytime I got upset about it, she would give me shit for not being able to take a joke. These jokes usually stopped just shy of outright insulting me. When Lucy wanted to break me down, she was super affectionate. She would sleep on my chest while we rode home on the bus and she'd even talk about herself from time to time. I don't remember the first time she hit me though. It seems like something that would be burned into my memory, some kind of cinematic moment in my life. Honestly, it all just blended together after a while. I know it started off small though, flicking me and playful slapping as well. By the end of it, she would elbow me in the ribs for telling a bad joke. It didn't register as anything abusive until she slammed me into the wall while we were walking through the hallway after class. I told a shitty joke and she shoved me hard into the wall. She laughed because of the sound I made before shoving me again. People were going through the halls with us but didn't do anything about it. Sometimes I wonder what they thought about me. I didn't dump her after that hallway incident but I did start standing up for myself. We started getting into a lot of fights after that. Of course, they only ever ended in one of two ways. She was right or it was an honest mistake. I tried to break things off a few times around that time, but every time I did, 
She had a new sob story that I hadn't heard before that made her actions totally understandable. I let it in my head that she was some tragic soul and that I could help her. I convinced myself there was something noble about taking the abuse and nobody I knew tried to step in and stop me. I finally got the nerve to dump her after three major things happened within a three week span. First, I found out that she was taking pictures of me while I wasn't looking and she was posting them online. The weird thing was that I only found out because she showed me. It felt gross seeing a bunch of nearly identical pictures of me not facing the camera. The way she showed me was worse however. She seemed excited like I'd be happy she invaded my privacy. The second weird thing happened when I tried to wake her on the bus. After about a half hour on my chest, not saying anything, I nudged her shoulder since we were at her stop and she just got up, looked me in the eye, and told me she wasn't asleep. Combined with the pictures, this seemed really weird to me. She didn't try to be cute or romantic about it or anything, just I pretend to sleep on you sometimes. Like, what the hell? The breaking point came when she was showing off some awards she got from school. There was something off about that award. It didn't have her name on it. Oh no, it had a name alright. It even had a picture of her smiling on it. The problem was, it wasn't addressed to a Lucy. You can't imagine what I felt when I found out I didn't know my girlfriend's name. A few days later, we got into one of our usual fights, and I broke things off. Lucy was the persistent type. She would sit a few rows behind me on the bus and stare at me while I went to my car after getting off the bus. Looking at her wouldn't make her stop. It felt like she wanted me to know she was watching me. One day when she got on the bus, she looked me right in the eyes for a solid 20 seconds while she walked past me to her new seat. I'm pretty sure she was expecting me to say something to her. The next year I graduated and got a retail job. End of the story, right? Well, I thought so too. It was the start of Christmas season and I was working cashier that night. Lucy came into the store I was working at, random chance. It had been a year and a half since we broke up at this point, so I wasn't happy to see her, but surely we could pretend it wasn't weird. She gave me the look the squirrel in Ice Age gives his nut. She grabbed something from the front and went right into my line. She didn't say a word to me, but she wouldn't break eye contact and she was swaying like an excited toddler. It hurt to look at her. I rang her up silently and waited for her to leave. I looked at the other cashier for support and he told me she was giving her weird vibes as well. I got this really bad gut feeling after she left. Lucy became a regular at our little shop. She would come in and creep out my co-workers. Lucy never really tried to hide what she was doing. One of the cashiers mentioned how often she came while ringing her out and she said she was visiting me. She didn't say my name but she described me. After that, whenever she showed up, someone would make a note of it on the radio. She was usually in one of the areas bordering my workspace. I heard about her a lot more than I saw her, so I think she was hiding from me. She never got banned from the store despite complaints, because the managers were penny-pinching assholes who would sell any one of us out to get sales up. I know Lucy was responsible for at least one resignation from my workplace. Someone who looked like me caught her staring a few times and heard how often she came. After a while, the stress just wasn't worth a minimum wage. The last time I saw Lucy at the store was a little over a year ago now. I was hanging out with one of the girls in the back while we were loading up carts with stuff we had to stock. We were right by the back entrance so you could see right in front of the store proper. I left to put up the stuff in my cart and when I came back, I saw her. She was standing about 40 feet from the back entrance, still as a statue. I froze when I saw her. I watched her stare into the back for what felt like hours before she suddenly turned and walked briskly away. 
The girl I was talking to was still in the back when I got back there. She was a lot more awkward after that. The girl then quit three days later and just about crushed my ribs when she hugged me goodbye. She hated her job, so I'd like to think it didn't have anything to do with Lucy, but I guess I don't know. I left the store not too long after that and got a job that didn't involve customer service. That, however, wasn't the last time that I saw her. Over the summer, after taking my new job, I had a mental breakdown. I convinced myself that I was unlovable and that Lucy was the only person I could possibly be with. I left the house without any conceivable plan to find her. With stars in the sky, lit by street lamps, I saw her. She was with another girl. I got so close that I could almost touch her before I finally snapped to my senses. I thought about her stalking me at the store, and I realized I was becoming her. I ran home. I cried that night. The last time I saw Lucy was last week. I was walking home from work and decided to stop for dinner. I thought I saw her in line, but I convinced myself it was somebody else. I then ordered and sat down to eat. I was looking out the window while I ate, and she took the table between me and the window I was looking out. She was with some guy that looked vaguely familiar, maybe a school friend. She was sat at an angle, so she was half looking at me, and every few seconds, she would look right at me. I know it was her. She changed her hair as well. It looks an awful lot like mine now. After I finished, I went to the bathroom because I felt sick. After washing my hands, I looked into the mirror and I felt like I could die. It hadn't occurred to me before, but I was wearing my work uniform, complete with company name on my hat in big letters. She was reading my hat. Lucy hasn't been to my current job yet, but I'm sure she's going to turn up eventually. I'm moving soon, so I'm just hoping I'm not here anymore when Lucy turns up. Lucy has been a part of my life for the last four years. We dated for four months in high school, and she somehow keeps turning up. I wasn't a paragon of mental health before I met her, but I feel like she broke me as a person, and I'll never forgive her for what she did to me. Since her abuse and her stalking, I have developed serious trust issues. I get painfully nervous leaving my house, and people who show interest in me immediately put me on edge. Now I have tried to date since everything happened, but unfortunately, I just can't. I'm too much work at this point, so I've just decided that I'll stay single until I can work through my issues. I'm begging you, Lucy, please, let's never meet again.